everyone and welcome to the second installment of the Town of Ajax's In Conversation with Speaker series. The Town of Ajax's newest initiative to engage residents on a variety of topics related to community, diversity, and inclusion. Tonight's speaker topic is the Me Too movement, power, privilege, and consent. It promises to be a night of education, of awareness, and of collective discussion. Thank you to those of you who have joined us in our audience, and thank you to those of you who have joined us online tonight. The In Conversation series, speaker series is supported by the, the Impact Ajax Community Support Program. Since 2013, this program has been dedicated to providing funding and resource supports for the Ajax community to continually increase the quality of life for its residents. This program also serves our community by providing capacity de development opportunities for both residents and community organizations, which is what you are about to experience tonight. If you are interested in finding out more about Impact Ajax, please visit ajax.ca slash impact or grab one of our cards at, on your way out. In addition, we are currently accepting applications for 2019 Impact Ajax funding. And again, applications can be found online at ajax.ca slash impact. The Me Too movement came to the forefront of media attention in 2017 when Alyssa Milano tweeted a statement sent to her by a friend. If all women who have been sexually harassed or assaulted wrote, me too, as a status, we might give people a sense of the magnitude of the problem. Milano then completed her post with the sentence, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write, me too, as a reply to this tweet. What followed was the ignition of a global social media movement. Since Milano's initial tweet, hashtag me too has been shared across 85 countries on Twitter and posted over 85 million times on Facebook. Hashtag Me Too quickly trended in North America as well as across the globe. More than 50,000 people replied to the tweet overnight, disclosing their own experiences. This included various celebrities. Global traction for this movement mirrors the World Health Organization's estimates that 35% of women worldwide have experienced either sexual and or physical violence in their lifetime. That's about one in three women. While Milano has helped to reignite the movement, the phrase Me Too has been active for over a decade, led by Tarana Burke, which you will hear more about this evening. The Me Too movement has given a voice to victims of sexual harassment and assault, and now, more than ever, women are speaking up about their experiences, and perpetrators are being called upon to be accountable for their actions. Tonight, we are here to collectively discuss this movement and how it relates to power, privilege, and consent. Tonight, we are thrilled to have five expert panelists here with us to discuss the topics of power, privilege, and consent in relation to the hashtag MeToo movement. Sharon Lorisella, PhD, Associate Professor, Communications at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. Candace Johnson, PhD, Professor of Political Science, University of Guelph. Sidra Ahmed, founder of the Rivers of Hope Project on Islamic Phobic Violence. Luke Hanna Frazier, advocate and member of Durham Men Take Action, and finally, Bonnie Porter, coordinator, Violence Prevention Coordinating Council of Durham. As well tonight, we are joined by our expert moderator, Yvette Nechtaval drew Executive Director of Girls Inc. Tonight, the agenda will be as follows. We will hear short presentations from each of the five expert speakers. Immediately following this, there will be a panel discussion facilitated by our moderator. During the panel discussion, we encourage you to raise your hand if you have a question, or if you feel more comfortable, please write your question on a post-it note and provide it to one of our staff or volunteers, if they could please raise their hands. Also, join in the conversation online. Ask questions to our speakers on the town's Facebook or Twitter by using the hashtag InConvoAjax. Any questions that we are unable to answer at this time, we would be happy to provide a response following the event. If you are sharing photos or videos of this evening, please make sure to tag us at Town of Ajax. Before we hear from our topic experts, we would first like to invite Tracy Vaughn, the Director of Recreation, Culture and Community Development to join us on stage. First, I want to thank everyone for coming, whether online or in person. It's truly important for us as a community to have important conversations. But first, before we begin, I would like to begin the evening by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga, adjacent to the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. 
and in the territory covered by the Williams Treaty. This place is and will continue to be home to Indigenous people. Let us move forward together with kindness and respect. An acknowledgement of territory is an invitation to reflect on personal relationships with Indigenous nations. When we acknowledge treaty, we are asking individuals to explore their rights and responsibilities to place and to people. And when land is acknowledged, we are encouraging you to seek out the history and the teachings of the natural world. Next, I would like to acknowledge some special guests who are here this evening. We have a number of town staff who are uh, joining us to facilitate any conversations that you have and certainly have the uh, overwhelming support of our Mayor and Council for tonight's event. So we're excited to have you here this evening. We hope you're excited to be here to learn, to discuss, to share uh, about this very meaningful topic. And I will turn it back over to Kayla. Thank you, Tracy. Before we get started, we would of course like to address some housekeeping items. So tonight's event includes both in-person as well as live stream attendance. Hi to all of you. Uh, to access the live stream, please visit ajax.ca slash in conversation or join us on Facebook Live. Following the event, you can also access the full live stream from this evening by visiting the town's YouTube channel. The washrooms are located in the lobby to both the right and the left of the main entrance. In the unlikely event of an emergency this evening, please remain calm and follow staff directions. Emergency exits are located to our right side, um, also in the main lobby. The bar will, of course, remain open for the duration of the event. Please feel free to access it at any time and please drink responsibly. Snacks and refreshments are available in our main lobby. On a more serious note this evening, some of the content that's discussed may trigger emotions or experiences in our audience. We suggest and we encourage you to please practice self-care as needed. We suggest viewer discretion is also advised as some of the presentations and discussions may contain language or images that are not suitable to all audiences. However, please note that if you do need support, we have resources on site this evening located in the main lobby. Thank you to Horizon House for participating and providing those resources. The In Conversation with Speaker Series aims to provide an environment of shared learning and we look forward to being your host. But please note that the views discussed tonight do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Town of Ajax. Your participation, ideas and feedback are central to the continued development of this series. While dialogue, questions, and comments are, enc are encouraged during our question and answer after the presentations, we want to ensure that all participants and presenters feel welcome and included in the discussion. We ask that all participants be respectful and refrain from comments which contain profanity or discrimination on the basis of race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, mental or physical disability, gender identity, expression, or sexual orientation, personal attacks or defamatory statements, insensitive comments, and any other message that does not contribute meaningfully to the conversation and the overall mission of shared learning. So without further ado, enough of the talking heads from the town of Ajax. Uh, at this time, we would like to welcome our moderator for this evening. We are so excited to have you with us, Yvette. Yvette is the executive director of Girls Inc and has over 25 years of experience working in the not-for-profit sector, and hard to believe when you look at that 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 would be the case, but uh, certainly is, uh, and has been Executive Director of Girls Incorporated of Durham for the last 13 years. Yvette has worked hard to be a strong and fearless advocate for girls' and women's issues. Girls Inc. has been recognized by the Fraser Institute as one of the top-run not-for-profits in Canada. They were ranked in the top three in the education category. Girls Inc. is positioned to have the most significant and life-changing impact on girls, serving over 1,600 girls last year. The amount of the scope that you have and the reach you have is truly incredible. They are dedicated to empowering individual girls, supporting, mentoring, and guiding them in safe, affirming, girls-only environments. They deliver in-school and community-based programs that tackle self-esteem, bullying, sexual assault, and healthy relationships. Their research-based programs give girls the tools to lead healthy, educated, and independent lives. Girls Inc. also works to improve the conditions in which all girls live by advocating for legislation and policies that improve their chances to succeed. Yvette's leadership, dedication, diligence, and I would say passion 
has earned her the respect of her colleagues and peers as she was nominated for the Women of Distinction Award in 2007, 2013, 2017, and received the Friends of Health Award in 2011. She's a mother of two adult children, Natasha and Brayden, who are strong feminists and has lived in Ajax for 38 years. We are proud to say that she calls Ajax home. We will now turn this evening over to her to introduce and to welcome our speakers. Thank you. Wow, that's, uh, that was wonderful. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome in Conversations with Speaker Series. I'm honored to be moderating this evening discussion. As mentioned, each speaker will have an opportunity to present their work on the Me Too movement regarding power, privilege, and consent. Following this, we will engage in an important dialogue on the topic and a question and answer with the audience. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker this evening, Dr. Sharon Lucera. Sharon is Associate Professor with the Program Director in the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities at UOIT in Oshawa. She holds a doctorate degree from the University of Cambridge in England and a Bachelor of Arts from Wheaton College in Massachusetts. Sharon's research focuses on digital feminist identities and gender issues in social media. Sharon has been recognized for teaching excellence, having awarded the UOIT Teaching Award twice, and the Social Science and Humanities Faculty Teaching Award. She teaches courses in communication, ethics, public speaking, nonviolent communication, and special topics in communication scholarships. Sharon, the floor is yours. Thank you, that was a lovely introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me tonight and for everyone for coming here. A special uh, thank you to my family and my friends and my colleague and special uh, welcome to my students who are here being awesome. Uh, there, you get extra credit and you get extra credit and you all get extra credit, you all get extra credit. So thank you all for, for showing up here tonight. So I want to start um, tonight by acknowledging that the Me Too movement is actually not really new. The movement took hold on social media in 2017 after a series of accusations against Harvey Weinstein. However, uh, the movement was an initiative over 10 years ago by a woman named Tarana Burke. And she's an activist from Harlem and she launched the movement to help underprivileged women of color who were affected by sexual abu abuse. And then Alyssa Milano kickstarted the social media campaign with this tweet in the fall of 2017, and she invited people to make responses to that tweet. And you can see here that uh, just the day afterwards, there were over 66,000 responses to her tweet, which really shows how significant the impact of this was. And when Tarana Burke started the movement, she did it because she believed that Me Too really wasn't all that important as a viral campaign, like a, something that was gonna take over the world. For her, it was more about survivors saying, I'm not ashamed and I'm not alone. And for supporters to say, I see you, I hear you, I'm with you, and I understand you. And equally importantly, Me Too places blame on the perpetrator and not the victim, right? So this was really important for her. And then you can see here a few of the men who were accused of sexual harassment. There's more assault, misconduct, or rape. And Harvey Weinstein was the first, not the first man, just the first in this whole movement in 2017. And then extending through 2018, it's really become a movement. And some people call it a revolution. And I, I really would agree with that, that it really is a revolution, especially with, uh, with what we're seeing in contemporary days right now. And there are a few things in common with these men. And we'll see on the next slide. They start by saying, I'm really sorry, but, and there's always this but at the end, right? They say, it was a different time. It was, you know, it was so long ago. It was, it was before. And then they say, 
everyone is doing it. Everyone was doing it. I was just like everybody else. And then they say, well, it was, it was just a joke. I was just kind of kidding. Or I, I just really didn't mean it. I didn't mean any harm. Or no one got hurt. It's really, what's the big deal? It, it really, it didn't really mean anything. It was just kind of a joke. It wasn't important. And the reason these excuses continue to come out the way they do is because we live in a system of rape culture. And you say, what the heck is that? That sounds really scary. And you're right, it is really scary. And it, it means that rape is normalized in our culture. And you might think, no, I don't think rape is normal. I don't think rape is okay. It's totally not okay. Rape is totally wrong. But consider that rape culture is part of our overall system where you know women get catcalled or women get called out or women are objectified. And we kind of think, oh, well, women must like it. And men kind of just do it because that's sort of how they are. That's, you know, people, that's just how things go, right? So, you know, men do it, women are supposed to like it, and women are objectified, and we live in this reality every single day. And another aspect of rape culture that I want to highlight is blaming the victim, and we see a lot of this these days. When someone gets raped or assaulted, people say, what do people say? Any of my students, when someone gets raped or assaulted, what do people who don't understand, what do they say? What was she wearing? Yeah, what was she wearing? What else do they ask? Was she drinking? Yeah. Were you drunk? Well, how drunk were you? What were you wearing? Did you fight? Did you fight back? Did you fight back hard enough? Well, you must, you must not have really wanted him to stop if you didn't fight back that hard, right? So another problem is that there's no consequences for this behavior. Like, look at R. Kelly. He was in the, the slide before this one. He married an underage child. He ran an abusive sex cult. I'm not making this up. He abused numerous children, including underage girls, and he's still one of the most successful rap artists. There's no consequences. Louis C.K. is back on the scene, and he's had almost no punitive issues at all. So we, what about this? Like, we teach girls and women not to get raped. We tell them, well, you should dress properly, you should cover your shoulders, you should dress conservatively, don't expose your body, rather, than teaching boys and men don't sexually assault girls and women. And what a novel idea. Wow, we could teach boys and men not to not behave badly, and rather, we could do that rather than making women and girls responsible for boys and men's behavior or for their misconduct. So I want to talk about a particular social media event that will give us a little bit of levity here. Um, Kate Harding is a British feminist and activist, and she posted a tweet, and she said, I'll read it if you can't read it in the back, she says, I'm really sorry for all the times I stabbed men, like just a little bit in the, the place I worked before, and now, now I've gone to counseling and I stopped stabbing men. And she says, she, her next tweet was, my childhood was bad. I barely even really stabbed them, sorry. And, and some of them are actually lying about it. I didn't really do it. But anyway, I'm sorry. I'm going to spend some time with my family. Now, this is made up, clearly. So this isn't really true. She did it as a spoof, right? So this is a spoof. And it just echoes back some of these hollow and disingenuous apologies that we see from men. And this tweet absolutely took off on social media. And it took off for two reasons. One, because it's funny. Even I, there are a few laughs in here, it's funny. And second, it makes sense. It makes sense and it's funny because it turns the whole thing inside out and backwards, right? What if a woman said the things that some of these men are saying? We realize how incredibly absurd it is. And I'm an academic and I, I'm a gigantic nerd and I, I practice qualitative methods. So I took to analyzing what happened after this tweet went out. And it's so fun. Wait till you see, it's so cool. Um, I'll show you the next slide here. People responded to her tweet. And are you sure they didn't like it? Well, maybe they just like the attention. Or, well, 
I naturally want to stab men. Maybe men just shouldn't come to work if they can't handle me stabbing them. Or, well, men like dress like they want, they want to get stabbed. You know those cargo pants, those are really like sexual, you know? Um, so what these tweets mean is that our culture believes that women actually like it and that it's men's natural instinct and that women act like they want to be raped or assaulted and all of these are, are obviously not true. And in our next slide, I'll let you read that for a moment. The, the first tweet shows that when we talk about rape and assault, people believe that it's the woman's fault because she makes herself vulnerable. Like, well, if you were alone with someone, well, what do you expect? Certainly it's gonna happen, right? Again, that's victim blaming. And then in the second tweet, you know, oh, woe is me. Our, our culture's gone down the drain. All women are sluts and whores. Oh my gosh, cover ourselves up. Everybody go back to church. Right? So that's kind of what, what this second tweet is saying. And then um, in our, our next slide here, she says, this woman says, well, they kind of invited me to do it. They let me, yeah, they let me stab them. It was so enticing. And then the second one, um, it, this is my favorite, because this brings back, this harkens back to Donald Trump's comment about locker room talked, right? So they're saying, well, I stabbed a dude in the crotch, but oh, that was just, that was just yoga studio talk, right? So it's really bringing, bringing the whole thing inside out and backwards. And, and, if, and if a woman says these bizarre things like it's locker room talk, it just doesn't fit, right? And then in the last um, tweet, she says, well, you know, some men, they get really hammered and then they wake up the next day and go, oh my God stabbed and they're they're saying you know it, that alcohol is not an excuse right just because you were drinking doesn't mean that it's okay so I want to leave you tonight feeling empowered and educated I don't want you to feel like oh my gosh we live in this terrible rape culture which we do I do want don't, do want you to know that however I want you to feel empowered and not sort of a woe is me now what do I do oh my god I need to change the world so I want to encourage you to be a rape myth buster myth number one is that rape is normal everyone's doing it Donald Trump did it it's just part of our culture and you can see in these um, tweets that are coming up next that, um, you know, everyone was doing it. That's not an excuse. First of all, it's not true. And second, it's not an excuse. And just because people are doing it doesn't mean it's right. And the truth here is that rape is not normal. It's not okay. And that's the first rape myth that you can bust. And the second one is that victims ask for it. And there's a tweet here that illustrates this, that, you know, if he didn't want to be stabbed, he shouldn't have worn his cargo pants, or he shouldn't have, he, he should have worn a tie and closed himself up, right? So the truth here is that victims never ask for it, ever. And what people wear is never an excuse. We could all be walking around here in thongs and no one should be raping each other just because we're all scantily clad. It doesn't, doesn't make a difference. So what people wear is never an excuse. And then the third that I wanna leave you with is that biological essentialism is to blame. And I will tell you, the term biological essentialism, if you bring the term biological essentialism to a party, you're gonna be the coolest person there. Okay, totally. And students, it's the best. You go to parties and you, you bring out the biological essentialism and people are, people are gonna want you for the rest of your life. Biological essentialism means that men are just hardwired to be sexual. It's just inevitable. That's the way men are. Well, it's not true. That is not true. Certainly there are some differences between men and women, but men are not hardwired to sexually assault people, that is not an excuse and we have to ditch that in our culture. So um, there's some, some tweets here. 
where this woman is saying, well, if I was alone with a man for lunch, well, of course I was going to stab him. So it's kind of like, you know, if you go out on a date with someone that you owe them sex or something, well, no, that's this biological thing is, is not an excuse and it's not rational and it's not okay. So um, biological essentialism doesn't work. Instead, I'd like you to get rid of these destructive phrases and this destructive stereotyping. Instead of boys will be boys, men will be men, how about boys will be nice people, men will be awesome, men will be helpful, men will believe women, right? So we gotta get rid of these destructive phrases in our culture. So I'd like to leave you with some takeaways for tonight. First, that Tarana Burke started Me Too 10 years ago, that Me Too is not new, that we are indebted to um, this movement that started with um, women of color and that we, we owe that acknowledgement to them. And then um, second, an apology is not an excuse and an excuse is not an apology. Those are two different things, right? And uh, third, you're gonna see rape culture and rape myths now that I've kind of shed a little bit of light and there's m tons of them. I've really only highlighted three or four tonight. Now, you're gonna see them everywhere. And for that, sorry, not sorry. You're gonna see them everywhere, right? You're gonna see victim blaming everywhere. You're gonna see um, you know, excuses everywhere. And finally, I'd like to leave you with the notion that you can end rape culture in your own family, in your own classrooms, in your workplaces, with your friends, in your friend group, however you communicate with people, you can be an agent for change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. That was wonderful. I really enjoyed the analogy and the, the myth busting as well. And uh, I think that um, <clears throat> we have a question. Um, last week, a new hashtag started trending, the why I did not report it. Can you speak to the complexities and nuances involved in making a claim and coming forward? That's a great question. I think it's really important right now because that um, Hashtag only just came out in the last week or so. And also what's happening with um, the su Supreme Court appointee Brett Kavanaugh and um, the debate in the United States. So one of the things I was thinking is that when is it acceptable for a woman to come forward? If a woman comes forward when she's young, people say, oh, well, she just doesn't understand. She's too young to know. You know, we make, people make these excuses like she can't be believed, she's too young. But then if a woman comes out with an accusation later when she's 40, even if the accusation is 30 years old, well, she's bitter and she's angry and she's, you know, she's washed up. Well, in that case, like when is it acceptable for a woman to come forward? You know, there's, this leaves women in the balance, like I can't make a report soon, I can't make a report later. And then if we report a man when he's young, it's like, oh, we don't want to ruin his future. And then if we report a man when he's older, it's like, oh, well, it was a different time. It was, it was a long time ago, it doesn't really matter. So we have these excuses and this is why, you know, women, don't report and I think some of my colleagues will talk about the more navigating the system and um, more physical uh, challenges later tonight. Um, for me, it's more about the social and cultural uh, reasons for that challenge. Thank you, that's right, that's wonderful. Uh, I think we're, we're seeing that as well and um, you know, I think not only seeing um, the, um, that I'm, I'm not alone, but also that I'm believed is a, a huge message that we're seeing over and over uh, in the news today. I would like to introduce Dr. Candace Johnson, Professor of Political Science from the University of Guelph. Candace Johnson is a political theorist with expertise in gender politics, maternity health policy, and reproductive rights. 
Her book, Maternal Transition, A North-South Politics of Pregnancy and Childbirth, was published by Rodelich 2014 and 2016, is a com comparative examination of maternal health preferences in Canada, the United States, Cuba, and Honduras, and the ways in which these preferences reflect global, regional, national, and microscholar dynamics. She has also published more widely on women in politics, health care, policy, social rights, and Latin American politics. Her latest book, Project, is a volume of human and environmental <clears throat> justice in Guatemala, co-edited with Stephen Hygiene, forthcoming with the University of Toronto Press. In 20, oh, 20, 2009 and again in 2017, Professor Johnson was awarded the Canadian Political Science Association Jill Victor's Prize in recognition for her work on gender and politics, and she was nominated for this award on two other occasions. Her current research includes an examination of the global Me Too movement and a project on Canada's global maternal health commitments and practice. Candace, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yvette, for that very generous introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank the organizers for this evening, Laura and Kayla, for inviting me here, the town of Ajax. Um, I'd like to, like to thank all of you for coming out um, to listen to the presentations and to discuss this important topic. Uh, and thanks to Sharon for getting the conversation started. For my presentation tonight, I'd like to tell two stories about the global Me Too movement. The first is a personal one. I was shielded from the realities of women's low status and subordination until I was in about my mid-twenties. My own mother was a fiercely independent thinker whose hard work inside and outside the home sustained our family in economic and emotional terms. She never spoke of feminism nor of women's struggles as women. I had no idea that I was unequal or disadvantaged in any way until I was a graduate student in political science trying to navigate the university as a scholar in training. During graduate school I experience, experienced subtle forms of harassment and subordination. One male professor suggested that one of my male colleagues should check over my work. I was consistently passed over for scholarships that were won by male stu students. I was brutally undermined by a female faculty member who should have been my supporter. And I observed more flagrant violations, such as older male professors having relationships, both clandestine and out in the open, with female graduate students. What at first appeared to be singular slights and violations began to reveal themselves to be patterns of gender-based subordination and sexual harassment. What at first appeared to be personal insults and nuisances attacks on learning environments and opportunities were revealed to be career limiting and for some women career ending attacks strategically launched as though they had been pre-programmed to destroy us all along. The impact of the damage only became more apparent when I began to work as a junior faculty member myself first at a university in the United States and then at my current institution in Canada. At the University in the United States, I experienced unwanted touching by two of my male colleagues in the workplace. The strangeness of the incidents caused me to dismiss them, while a more senior female colleague and mentor filed a complaint on my behalf. At my current university, my story of harassment is much too long to tell here. It is mostly the story of harassment by one senior male colleague, a predator, who manipulated me into meeting him for lunch off campus and then unleashed an unyielding barrage of inappropriate comments, commentary about other female colleagues and students' clothing and appearances, along with not so veiled threats about what might be bad for my career if I avoided his invitations in the future. He called me on the phone after looking up my phone number in the departmental directory. He showed up my up at my apartment uninvited and unannounced with a bottle of champagne after finding my address through that same directory. This part of the story is just the tip of the iceberg. With the support of my colleagues, 
both male and female, I filed an informal complaint and the harasser was sanctioned. The Me Too movement is, itself, is not itself about formal processes and sanctions. It's a movement dedicated to social justice first and foremost, and not strictly legal justice. I'm in agreement with legal scholar Catherine McKinnon that the Me Too movement has done what the law could not. McKinnon explains that it is widely thought that when something is legally prohibited, it more or less stops. This may be true for exceptional acts, but it is not true for pervasive practices like sexual harassment, including rape, that are built into structural social hierarchies. Equal pay has been the law for decades and still does not exist. Racial discrimination is nominally illegal in many forms, but is still widely practiced against people of color. If the same cultural inequalities are permitted to operate in law, as in the behavior the law prohibits, equalizing attempts such as sexual harassment law will be systemically resisted. This logjam, which has long paralyzed effective legal recourse for sexual harassment, is finally being broken. Structural misogyny, along with sexualized racism and class inequalities, is being publicly and pervasively challenged by women's voices. The difference is power is paying attention. In my own case, the existence of clear policies and mechanisms for redress enabled alternate informal avenues for complaint. With the Me Too movement, space is created not just for alternate avenues, but for an alternate universe that creates informal venues for the simultaneous expression of individual stories. It is the multiplication of voices that amplifies the claims of harassment and abuse. And this amplification has lent credibility to women's stories of their own experiences, which have tended to be disbelieved or dismissed. Professor McKinnon had conducted her own research on university campuses and found that women are not believed about sexual harassment or assault claims until at least four to five other women make similar complaints about the same individual perpetrator. I think we're at the right slide. When I first heard about the Me Too movement in the fall of 2017, I was exhilarated. I felt like we were on the threshold of a cultural reckoning that was long overdue. The toppling of well-known public figures like Harvey Weinstein with repeated accounts of outrageous behavior exposed those who existed in workplaces everywhere. Me Too has publicly shamed and sanctioned powerful men in the United States, Harvey Weinstein, Les Moonves, Louis C.K., Charlie Rose, Matt Lauer, Kevin Spacey, Larry Nasser, the U.S. gymnastics team doctor, and provides important support for claimants in the cases of Bill Cosby, which had been underway prior to Alyssa Milano's call to action on October 15, 2017. It also provides support to women who are not involved in culture-bearing cases, but are trying to navigate hostile and or sexualized spaces that diminish their social and professional worth. In Canada, Me Too is a movement, as it is in the United States, that calls attention to sexual harassment and abuse. Me Too frames the abuses of high-profile individuals like Gian Gomeshi, Jacob Hogarth of the rock band Headley, and important institutions like the Canadian military, parliament, universities, and the arts. So the second story that I'm telling is one about the predictable, sustained subordination of women through sexual violence. Each individual tweet, each individual story is part of a constellation of harassment and abuse that signals and reinforces women's subordination in virtually all areas of life. Social clubs, schools, universities, the workplace, and institutions of government. As Catherine McKinnon's quote demonstrates, women experience inequality in many forms. According to, statistics, to Statistics Canada, women make 87 cents for every dollar made by a man. The gender pay gap is nothing new. It is documentation of the persistent discrimination and disadvantage for women. The same agency, Statistics Canada, also reports that women do roughly double the number of unpaid hours of childcare in the household 
and 1.5 times as much unpaid housework. Women also have, on average, more years of formal education than men, but this does not translate in most sectors into senior positions or equal patterns of work workforce participation. According to Catalyst.org, only seven of the 249 companies listed on the main index of the Toronto Stock Exchange in September 2017 were run by women. This is less than 0.5% uh, or a half a percent. Women account for only 88 seats in the 338-seat House of Commons. That's 26%. And in Canadian universities, women account for only 28% of all faculty members at the rank of full professor. And as we know from a variety of sources and from the Me Too revelations, women are routinely harassed, even when there are clear policies in place to prohibit harassment, while they acquire more years of education, while they're working at lower levels and across all levels for lower pay while doing a disproportionate amount of unpaid care work and housework at home. The corresponding hashtag Time's Up, which is focused primarily on legal justice, needs no explanation in the context of this evidence. Me Too is extraordinary because it creates new patterns, global constellations of emotions, such as anger, rage, frustration, hope, that generate affective solidarity. Each point in the constellation is significant in questioning dominant cultural patterns, namely the manifestation of patriarchal culture in schools, workplaces, communities, and political institutions at all levels. The global Me Too movement draws on existing movements in many different places, such as Iran, Nigeria, and India, and provides additional political and social currency for women's claims of gender injustice, while also providing a virtual venue for the multi-level, global, regional, national, and local enterprise of denouncing injustice in its many forms. In Argentina, the Ni Una Menos movement, which in Spanish means not one woman less, began with a series of national anti-violence marches in June 2015 to protest femicide, the killing of women simply because they are women. According to Neonomenos organizers, in Argentina there's a woman killed every 30 hours as a result of gender-based aversion, related, for example, to domestic violence and gender transgressions. The United Nations Agency, UN Women, reports that among the 25 countries with the highest rates of femicide in the world, 14 are from Latin America and the Caribbean. In many countries, murder rates are not disaggregated by sex, but the picture comes into focus through a range of related indicators. According to the same UN Women report, and this is a lengthy quote, gender-related killings are the last act, a culmination in a series of violent acts. People often fail to recognize the deadly chain of events that lead to femicide. An, abus an abusive relationship doesn't start with murder, but the abuse escalates, and without timely intervention and support, the women may end up murdered. In Latin America, we have a culture of high tolerance towards violence against women and girls. You see it in the media all the time. Crimes against women are exhibited with very crude images, and nobody seems to care about it. Violence becomes normalized. It is seen as part of life for women. In some countries of the region, the domestic violence rates are as high as 50%. But violence against women also happens on the bus, in the streets, and in the workplace. We know that women often do not report violence, but even when they do, many crimes against women are not thoroughly investigated. Worldwide, almost one in two murdered women was killed by her partner or ex-partner in 2012. The ratio is one in 20 for men. United Nations initiatives, including the adoption of a protocol in developing specialized legislation to deal with femicide, with the participation of representatives from 16 different countries, have declared femicide to be linked to the low status of women in society and hatred towards women. In those 16 countries that signed on to the protocol, including Argentina, 
there are formal international guidelines for developing solutions to the problem of femicide. In Argentina, the birthplace of the Ni Una Menos movement, there are laws in place to address the problem of femicide, and the government has created a special office to deal with the broader problem of violence against women. A recent article explains that, with regard to women's rights, Argentina can boast comprehensive legislation as a result of either the passing of internal laws or the ratification of international treaties. This legislative inflation, however, has not been accompanied by sufficient funding for policies, making them and the whole system inefficient and ineffective. In other words, these formal measures have not yet anyway brought about a reduction in the rates of femicide or violence against women. The Ni Una Menos movement does what the Me Too movement does in the context of gender injustice. It allows for the global amplification of multiple voices that are empowering for women and compel their audiences to listen. In this way, laws governing sexual violence, femicide, sexual harassment and abuse are not the only levers for the powerless to exercise power. The powerless can now raise their voices with public authority and do not have to rely on uh, formal processes and venues. I've described the global Me Too movement as a cultural reckoning in broad terms and a beacon of hope for the powerless. I've not discussed backlash, which takes at least two forms. The first occurs in the form of violent reprisals. In Argentina, Ni Una Menos activist Micaela Garcia was assassinated in April 2017. She was 21 years old, an outspoken advocate for gender justice, and was raped and murdered by a man who had already been convicted of raping two other women. The other form of backlash comes in the form of concern for the male so-called victims of potential false accusations. False allegations of sexual violence are themselves a form of violence and should not be tolerated or encouraged. But that this potential error should call the Me Too movement for gender justice into question is seriously disheartening. The question about possible false allegations asks, what about the men? Me Too, for the most part, is about the women and their experiences as global sexual subordinates. I borrow from critical theorist Gayatri Spivak, who says that men and others on their behalf who feel aggrieved by being silenced, accused, questioned, made uncomfortable or confused, should feel angry at their, their experience of injustice. But they should not be angry with the individual women who have come forward to file a complaint or post an experience at hashtag me too. They should instead be angry that history has given them such a demeaning and oppressive script from which to read and act. Thank you. Thank you so much, Candace. Sexual harassment and assault is evidently not confined to North America. Is a hashtag enough? Does a hashtag translate on a global scale? Or do other communities need something different? And what would that look like? That, oh, that's loud enough. Um, that's a good question. I, of course, the hashtag is not enough. But I think that it is exciting that it has generated as much interest and enthusiasm as it has. It's generated all kinds of other emotions as well, rage and, and connection. Um, so while it's not sufficient, I think that it can contribute a lot of momentum to, uh, toward cultural change, which, um, as, uh, as Sharon was saying, is, is something that is, is critical in making much larger changes in the law and um, in the treatment of, uh, of women and, and men who are, who are also also victimized, although in this debate we're mostly talking about experiences of women. Um, I was going to say something else, but I've lost my train of thought, which is definitely a well, and I think it's hazard of the job. A, an audience here um, today to have that conversation, to start the conversation and, uh, and to, to address those issues, so thank you. I would like now to introduce Sidra Ahmad, former uh, founder of the Rivers of Hope Project of uh, Islamophobic Violence. Sidra is a fierce advocate for the rights of women and girls, contributes to these movements through writing, community organizing, and also speaking. She's the founder of the Rivers of Hope po Project, 
of Islamophobic Violence, which is a research-based initiative to support Muslim women survivors of Islamophobic harassment and abuse. Sudur also coordinates an anti-violence against women public education at the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants, OCASI. She holds a Master's of Arts in Adult Education and Community Development from the University of Toronto. Please welcome Sudra. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really uh, honored to be able to speak with everyone and to share a bit of my story and my thoughts with you today. So thank you so much for being here and for listening and uh, giving up your evening for this discussion. So I'm gonna start by taking you through a scene that I have been through and maybe some others in the audience have as well. I'm sitting at the computer, at my computer in the evening, looking over the news on social media, kind of at that place where you're tired and you're mindlessly scrolling through, ending the day, already had dinner. My eyes fixate on a story about a prominent man in the United States who has been accused of rape. Against my better judgment, I look at the story, I uh, see how it's being shared, and I read some of the comments. Immediately, I'm kind of overwhelmed with what I see. People are saying things like, she's a liar. They're asking, why did it take her so long to report? People are calling her crazy. People are saying that she wants attention. People are saying that, well, since there are gaps in her story and she doesn't quite remember the order of how everything happened, it must not be true. It goes on and on, and all of a sudden, I notice that the computer screen feels really bright, almost painful, but I still can't and I don't look away. I notice that my breathing has gone shallow, and in fact, I'm holding my breath at this point. My chest feels tight and my heart is pounding. My mind starts to race, my thoughts are swirling, and then in comes a thought that has been with me uh, many times, and that is if I ever spoke up, they would say this about me as well. That if I ever shared my story or came forward, uh, pressed charges, did X, Y, or Z, they would be saying these exact same things to me that I wanted attention, that I had no proof, that I was a liar, that I was making it up because there were gaps in my memory, that that means I, it's not true, and so on, and so on, and so on. And that conclusion that came into my mind makes my heart sink down into my stomach and I feel sick. So I finally turn off the computer and try to get it out of my mind, you know, have a cold glass of water, decide to read a nice book and, you know, hopefully get some sleep. And I do sleep and I'm happy that I fall asleep, but I have bad dreams that night, but, you know, could be worse. The next morning I wake up, I get ready, I go, I get ready, I put myself together, I go to work. And when I get to work, a colleague asks me, oh, how was your evening last night? You know, you had a long day yesterday, how was your evening? And I say, oh, it's fine. So that's a scene I wanted to start out with and, and to let you know that it's been seven years since I faced a sexual assault that turned my life upside down. But today here, even though we're at an event talking about Me Too and Me Too tends to push people to share their stories, I'm not gonna share my story with you. I'm not here to share details about the assault and I wanna push back against the idea that survivors have to relive their trauma in front of people and put it all out there on display. Almost sometimes it feels like it's bordering on entertainment, I'm not sure why. And it's as if we're not deserving of consideration unless we give out all these graphic details. So I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm gonna to refuse to do that tonight. And instead what I'm going to do is share the story of what happened to me after this sexual assault. What was the aftermath like? Because I really want people, you know, my dream is that more people understand what survivors need in the months and years after something like this happens. What happens after someone says me too? You know, and that's one thing that worries me about the hashtag is that people feel like me too is the event. And then what happens afterwards? You know, who's there for the woman who tweets out her story at one in the morning with the hashtag? What supports does she have? So that's what I'm gonna share with you about, you know, what I like to call the long-term, or not what I like to call, what is, the, what is called the long-term impact of sexual assault. 
So first I'll take you to the first six months afterwards. Immediately after the assault, I had post-traumatic stress. You know, most people think about this in terms of what soldiers get when they come back from war, the jumpy, you know, uh, but post-traumatic stress is something that happens to survivors of sexual assault. What did that look like? To be honest, it was so strange. My brain stopped working, you know? So I had a job and I was used to going at the, to the job and doing work and I remember just thinking, you know what, I'm just gonna go back to my job and move on and do this work. And I was there sitting at my computer and like the lights weren't on, like my brain stopped working. It was, it was really shocking to me. I would space out, I lost a laptop on the subway for some reason that really bothers me and I would cry uncontrollably. I was really on edge around men, even male friends that I'd had for a long time, I just couldn't be around them. And this is huge, I withdrew from my social and professional network because the man who harmed me was part of that network and surprise, surprise, he had a really good re reputation there, he was really respected by a lot of our mutual friends and acquaintances. So what did I do in the state that I was in is I removed myself. I didn't think anyone would believe me. So I let go and I stepped away from that whole career track. And you know, I really wanna point that out because you know, as my you know, wonderful panelists have already shared, so often you know, in discussions about Me Too, when we think about you know, what about the man who's accused of sexual violence? What will be the impact on his life and on his career? if someone comes forward and holds him accountable, everything he's worked for and built, you know, everything he's put together, his education, his craft, his art, that, you know, people are very worried about that, but rarely do people worry about the impact of sexual violence on the survivor. What about her career? What about everything she's built? What about all the work she's put in? What about her art? You know, no one's really mourning that. No one's really worried about that. And that double standard really doesn't pl pass the smell test for me. You know, recently we've seen um, a prominent uh, Canadian perpetrator of sexual violence, Gian Gomeshi, he was given this 7,000 word um, spread in a really high profile uh, literary magazine in the United States to share his story, which was a fabricated story. And he was given this huge audience to be able to do that. And, you know, people were saying, well, why can't he make a comeback? You know, what about, his, you know, again, his career. And I think about Lucy de Couture, who's one of his, uh, one of the people he uh, was violent towards. You know, what about her career? Like where did, you know, she, she is not at the stage that she was before all of this happened. And people don't seem to be as worried about that. So, you know, that's why I think it's so important to share these impacts with folks. So I had that uh, PTSD and I'm so fortunate that I was able to, to get counseling from a, an agency and it was free and I'm so grateful that it was free. I don't know what I would do without that. And there I learned a lot about like, okay, I'm not losing my mind. This is actually what happens. This is a natural reaction to incidents like this. And I learned about trauma. And you know, one thing I learned about trauma that I think is so important, I wish everyone would know about this, is that um, when there's, when you're in a situation of assault, it's so terrifying that your brain can go into something called fight or flight mode. I'm sure everyone's heard about that, fight or flight mode. And when you're in fight or flight, in those times, often our memories don't work as well, you know? So you'll hear things about like, you know, I can't tell you if the person had a gray shirt or a blue shirt, I was trying to survive, right? But that, so, and that's neurobiological, that's what happens in our brains, we have no control over it, fight or flight mode in a moment of trauma. But what happens is that's used to discredit survivors. Like, what do you mean you don't remember if, you had a, if he had a gray or blue shirt? That must mean you're lying, you know? And it's so frustrating to see that over and over. And I see that in my news feed a lot over and over. How come she doesn't remember all the details? She must be lying. So that's one thing I, I would hope more people would be aware of. So, I mean, we've talked about a lot today. You know, you've heard about some of the statistics. We know that one in three women will face sexual violence in her lifetime. But I wanna point out that women who are facing other forms of oppression, in addition to sexism, are even more likely to be targeted for sexual violence. I think of indigenous women and girls in Canada who face much higher rates of sexual violence than, uh, than those who are not. And this is because of the legacy of colonialism, you know? And I think about how this past year I'm not sure if folks follow, were following the story of a 15-year-old named Tina Fontaine who was murdered. And 
the person who was accused of murdering her was a 55-year-old man, and there was a lot of evidence linking him to this murder. A, a jury found him not guilty, much to the horror of so many activists working on the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous girls, right? So when we think about Me Too, we need to think about what are the additional oppressions at play here. I think about black women and girls, you know, we know the founder of the Me Too, woman, Me Too movement is a black woman. And she was pointing out to the fact that the sexual violence that affects black girls is very um, underreported and undervalued. Black girls are sexualized at a very young age and treated as if they're adult women and not being seen as deserving of safety and protection. I think of women with physical or mental disabilities who we know face three times the rates of sexual violence as other women. I think of trans women, particularly trans women of color who fa face very high rates of violence and often don't feel safe or welcome in services that are supposed to be there for women who experience violence. I also think about women who do not have permanent status in Canada, uh, who are not permanent residents here and who may fear accessing services or leaving their abuser because they're worried they'll be reported and get deported from the country. But the stories of these women, indigenous women, black women, trans women, women with disabilities, women without status, they are not typically the face of, the, of our stories when we talk about Me Too. They are not prominent or featured in our discussions. And you know, they're often not invited to these kinds of panels. And their tweets, when, our, when they tweet, they don't get that 60,000 replies overnight, right? So you know, I think it's really important that we be critical of what's going on, even as we celebrate it. You know, many of the people on the panel have already mentioned that the Me Too movement was started by Tarana Burke, and she created the hashtag in order to raise awareness about the impact of sexual violence on black girls. But it was only when rich, mostly white celebrities took up the hashtag, and that's when people started paying attention. And I just ask, like, what does that tell us about whose stories matter, and what does that tell us about who's seen as worthy of protection and who's seen as disposable? And that's something that really needs to change. So everything I've been talking about with these different forms of oppression, I'm sure most people here have heard of a term called intersectionality. That's a term that was created by a black feminist scholar named Kimberly Crenshaw. She created this term simply to recognize the fact that not all women are oppressed in the same way. So even the statistics about the gender pay gap, yes, there's a gender pay gap between men and women, but the gender pay gap is even bigger when you talk about the pay gap between men and women of color. And even bigger than that, when you think about the gender pay gap between white men and indigenous women, it gets even bigger. So intersectionality uh, helps us map out these different layers. And so what Kimberly Crenshaw argued and, and helped everyone understand is that when she experiences sexism in the world, it's overlayered by her experience of anti-black racism. There's no separating it. And so her um, framework that she gifted everybody with has been extended to help us understand other kinds of intersecting oppressions. And I personally have benefited from that knowledge because it's helped me understand how the sexism I experience is shaped by the fact that I'm a Muslim, a visibly Muslim woman of color. It's all interlinked for me. My Muslimness impacts my experience of sexism. How does it do that? People often will assume that I'm weak, uh, that I'm oppressed, and so on, right? So it's kind of sexism mixed with Islamophobia. There's no separating it from me. And that's why I believe that, you know, in these movements, we need to fight against all these multiple oppressions at once, or else we're only helping one kind of woman. So I am one of those people who is, you know, kind of torn. I'm inspired by the Me Too movement, but I don't currently see people like me and our stories represented in it, at least not in how it's shown in the, the media at large. And it is different, you know, not everyone has the same level of risk. It's risky for anyone to step forward as a survivor of sexual violence, but not everyone has the same level of risk. And I can share on a personal note, it's difficult for me to step forward as a survivor of sexual violence as a Muslim woman, it's difficult. Because there are so many stereotypes people have, it's kind of like, feels like walking through a minefield. If I share that I'm a survivor, people's first thought may be, well, I know who must have done that to her, you know, these, these you know, barbaric Muslim men, you know, I saw this movie that, you know, I'm sure it was exactly like that movie that I saw, and, you know, the stereotypes go on and on. I can often see people's wheels turning when I speak, and, you know, thinking that I'm meek and that I'm passive, all of these assumptions. The fact of the matter is, um, 
you know, in my case, the perpetrator was a white non-Muslim man. That happened to be the perpetrator in my case. And indeed, I believe he targeted me because of Islamophobic stereotypes. I believe that he thought that I was weak, oppressed, and an easy target, and that was the logic that led to it. So again, for me, all of these things are linked. I can't separate one from the other. For me, I have to fight all of it at once. So I want to tell you a bit more about the long-term impact of sexual assault. You know, getting back to that thing about what after Me Too? How can we support people? How can we actually have a meaningful change so people don't feel alone? So I had that PTSD for the, the six months um, after, or six plus months, um, but you know, with the trauma counseling, thank goodness, the tools I got there, things started to shift. You know, um, I was sleeping better, I got a, a job that I was happy with, and this is the point that I think that society wants to say, let's draw a line. Okay, you're better now. You're done, right? You're done. Your free counseling sessions are up. You got a job, check, check, you know, you're done. And I, I really, and it's, it's difficult, and I've talked to many other survivors, it's difficult because hearing that you think, oh, I'm supposed to be better now. Like, well, is something wrong with me? I'm not better. Um, so this idea that survivors have to get over it within this predetermined point of time has to go. Um, because my experience has been that even though I was more functional, I still had, you know, moments where there would be something that would bring me back to a lot of anxiety, you know, even flashbacks or nightmares. It still stayed with me. And I know if I was speaking to any other survivor, if I told them that on the anniversary of the assault, you know, when it was a year later, two years later, three years later, those days are always still hard for me, almost as if it's happening again. And, and this is something, you know, I always get nods from survivors. You know, it's something that, you know, survivors understand. And it's that I've really got a lot of support from speaking with other survivors who know what it's like, but I want everyone to at least try to understand what it's like because then we can start offering support that people need in the years after the assault. So I'm gonna, uh, as I wrap up, I wanna say that, you know, another thing uh, that too often people want when they hear stories around Me Too is they want a story of triumph, right? They want to, you know, the idea is by the end, I'm supposed to tell you I'm 100% better now and kind of have a neat picture, tie it up in a bow and help everyone, you know, kind of put it aside but I don't have a story of triumph. Um, the truth is, I still struggle. That story that I began with, that scene about being at the computer and then having a bit of a panic attack and the nightmares and all that sort of thing, that happened last week. It's been seven years since the assault. So that is a message I want to give you all. The impact of trauma can be long lasting. You know, at least in my case it is. And in the case of many other people I've spoken to, it is. And I, I feel like that's a story that we need to get out there with me too, that this isn't, this isn't a done deal after we share a story. So not, I don't wanna leave you on a, a low note though, because although I'm not giving you a story of triumph with really clean edges and a bow on it, I can share many ways that I've learned from my healing journey and from other survivors and use that to make a difference in the world, which I am truly happy about. Uh, as mentioned in the, in the introduction, I coordinate an anti-violence against women educational campaign now, you know, which is across the province, and it focuses on immigrant and refugee communities, and that's really cool. Um, you know, what motivates me is the idea that anyone who is in my position might be touched by the work that I do, and that really keeps me going. I've also launched a project on gendered Islamophobia, which is the specific form of discrimination and violence that Muslim women face. Because again, I believe that's why I was targeted, this idea that I'm weak. So it's, a very, it's an issue very close to my heart. And so the project is called Rivers of Hope. And in this project, I interviewed over 20 Muslim women who were survivors of Islamophobic uh, violence and assault, including survivors of sexual assault. So I've taken their stories and I've written kind of an academic paper about it, but also made a toolkit, again, to put it out into the community, to kind of give people what I think might have been useful to me or others like me, right? And more than anything, this helps me feel like I'm not alone and helps me be part of uh, helping other people feel like they're not alone and that heals me. I truly believe that survivors know how to support each other like no one else can, because we understand. But my dream is that we create communities where everyone can offer that level of support. And I, I don't think it's impossible. I think it's a matter of education. So that leads me to the final point I want to leave with you all today. 
I just want to give some really concrete tips on how to support someone in your life who has been through sexual assault. Here are some things you can say to her right away. One is, I believe you. Don't underestimate the power of saying that. Second thing to say is, it's not your fault. You know, uh, we had a wonderful review of all the different rape myths that, that are out there. Women are trained to blame ourselves when these things happen. So tell her a million times if you need to, it's not your fault. Another really great one I learned is to thank her. You know, thank you for trusting me. It took you so much courage to tell me this. Thank you, honoring what she's doing. Because that immediate reaction you give is going to be so important because, you know, it can, it can really make someone's healing journey sink or swim the way that you treat them at the beginning. And then when you connect her with resources, like the Assaulted Women's Helpline, which is a great place where you can you know, learn about what services there are in your area, present her with those resources, but don't take over and push her. You know, that's really important. You know, with sexual assault, someone's power of choice has been taken away from them. So what we wanna do when we're supporting them is give it back. Say, what do you, here's a resource, what do you wanna do with it? You choose, totally up to you. Whatever you choose, I'm behind you. So those, those simple uh, steps are, can make a world of difference. And then I would ask you to get support for yourself because I would encourage you to be there for her for the long haul on the anniversaries, right? On the day where it feels like, you know what? I feel like I'm back to square one. Be there for her, be there, for her for the long haul, but in order to do that, make sure you have support yourself because it's not easy. And, you know, finally, just educate yourself about sexual violence and, you know, the impact on survivors, how to offer support. There are so many resources, blogs, YouTube videos, articles, and books out there written, you know, in particular, I would suggest you read things um, and watch things that are made by survivors. There's so much great information out there. Don't rely on the splashy headlines and the way they um, will frame this issue. You can dig deeper and learn a lot. The more you know, you're going to be a really good friend to someone who's been through something like this. So I'm by saying that seven years ago when I was sitting at home trying to figure out what to do next, I never would have imagined that part of what I would eventually do is stand at a podium and say anything like I've just said. But um, I'm happy that I have this opportunity. I, I'd never take being listened to for granted. Uh, it means the world to me, and so I'm grateful for that. And I just want to encourage everyone, you know, you've done a huge thing by being here today, to just keep educating yourself and being part of this, taking care of yourself, to build a world for survivors that, you know, beyond Me Too, is truly supportive of the long-term impact of trauma and creating communities that can really respond to and heal that trauma. You know, so if my sharing this story contributes one thing, I hope that it motivates you to, you know, keep in the fight, or if you're not in the fight, to join. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your, your, uh, your brave journey and uh, your knowledge with us. Really appreciate that. I'm cognizant of time, so <clears throat> sorry, I would have uh, liked to ask you a, a question, but I'm going to hold um, your question until the end so that our other speakers will have an opportunity to um, do their presentation. I would like now to introduce Luke Hanna Frazier. He's an advocate and a member of the Men, Durham Men Take Action. Luke grew up in Orangeville, Ontario. He attended Fanshawe College, where he graduated with a diploma in law and security. He then attended the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Criminology. Luke remained in Durham Region after university, when he was employed in frontline social services for the past nine years. For the past four years, Luke has focused on providing frontline support to victims of gender-based violence in the criminal justice system. This frontline experience gained him a seat at the table with the Violence Prevention Coordinating Council of Durham. The VPCC appointed Luke as a group lead for Durham Men Take Action. Durham Men Take Action is an initiative that engages men as allies in the prevention of violence against women through action, education, and leadership. Let's give a warm welcome to Luke. Thank you. 
little bit taller, so I'm just going to adjust this. Thank you for having me. This is an extremely important conversation for me. I just want to take a step back, maybe not physically, because I have to speak into the mic, but I want to take a step back to acknowledge my privilege. Uh, my privilege as a man means that even though I have only a few years working as an advocate, I'm able to share this stage with uh, two very accomplished academics, uh, an accomplished journalist and advocate, and a lifetime mentor, uh, and actually a personal mentor to me. Uh, I'm somewhat of an unusual case being a man that talks about, works in, and is passionate about gender-based violence. I hold one perspective that is constantly growing in regards to violence against women in our communities. However, it's important for me to say that my perspective is as a cisgender white male and that no matter how much I learn, or how many people trust me with their individual stories, I will never precisely know the experiences of others. So as much as I can be a caretaker for these stories and their importance, it will always be important for me to recognize my privilege and use that to hold space for others. I think of an example, instead of me telling a story about someone's sexual harassment, it's more important for me to promote their telling of their experiences of sexual harassment. Kind of a final thing to say before getting into the meat of my presentation is that I don't have all the answers. I'm sorry, sir, in the, in the front row if that's what you came here for. You might be asking, why me? Am I some type of better man? Why am I doing this work? Do I care more? Do I have some sort of special skills? Maybe if you ask my mother. But the answer overwhelmingly is no. I'm just like you. And this presentation tonight is specifically for the men listening. And I thank you for that. So today I am excited to talk to you about my journey and how I became involved in Durham Men Take Action. Before I get into that, I also want to state, I know there's a lot here, um, that this isn't a debate speech. This is not an argument. This is not a political statement. This is a conversation. And I know that was prefaced at the beginning of this conversation, this opening. But what that means to me is that a conversation takes open-mindedness. It takes care and it takes cooperation. It was carefully set up that way and I really thank the organizers for doing that. And I wanted to remark on that because I think it is an important and crucial way to approach this topic. One of the most harmful things that we can do is turn this into a debate where our tribal instincts kick in, we anchor ourselves to a fundamental belief, we identify as the left or the right, and we become hell-bent on attacking any ideas that aren't perfectly in line with ours. The moment we can put down our competition is the moment we can make our biggest strides in, preve in preventing gender-based violence. So Durham Men Take Action is a grassroots movement. The purpose is to create space for men to learn about being an ally, to become an ally, and to take action by participating in anti-violence activities. Men don't often have an appropriate lens for with, for with which to view violence against women because they haven't created it. Until a family member, partner, coworker, is a victim of harassment, or worse, it doesn't often enter their sphere. I often hear the theme from men, I know this is important, I have a daughter. The simplicity of this statement really underscores for me a fundamental issue in men's understanding of violence against women. Who am I to critique this viewpoint? Some men are certainly listening because of that very fact because they have a daughter, and that's valuable too. The point I'm trying to make is that this was important before you had a daughter. So how can we help men understand that? For decades, violence against women has been regarded as a women's issue, and it's only recently that I have written here, despite all the hard work of women, but I wanna say in spite of the hard work of women, that men are finally able to step forward and say, 
and, and this is very crucial for me, men's violence against women is a men's issue. So this hard work of women has sparked men to begin understanding this issue and their importance within this issue. So I want to truly pull back the curtain and give you an honest view of how Durham Men Take Action started. Well, it was created by a group of women, hardworking, dedicated women who had, uh, who, who, had, who had essentially come from shelters, who had come from other advocacy groups, who had come from uh, health care, that knew that the key to prevention of violence against women included men. So a lot of hours went into the first step in creating this group to engage men. A one-day conference was started. They had amazing guest speakers. There was a delicious free lunch. It was all on work time. You know, there was a lot of, a lot of people saying, yeah, I can get behind this issue. I can relate. And they came to the conference. It was well attended. People were all excited to walk away with these tools to talk about toxic masculinity, about being an active bystander, and uh, that was really good. But the purpose of this uh, conference was not just to be an information session. The purpose was to facilitate action. And it kind of brings me to something I, I read on Reddit recently, um, and that's always dangerous kind of saying that, but uh, it, was a, it was a remarkable quote that was, uh, Nowadays, we're satisfied just being informed about a subject, and we have really little motivation to actually do something about it. This whole conference was trying to prove that idea wrong. So at the end of the conference, people were asked to do that very thing. People were asked to put their contact information down, to be invited to the next step, to take action. Instead of just saying, I support ending violence against women, and then going about your life. So, what happened was remarkable. People put their email addresses down, their contact information down. It seemed very positive. So we geared up for the second step. A venue was picked, food was ordered, two people showed up. I was one of them. The other guy quickly started to say, you know, I actually came here to say that I, I don't know if I can volunteer for this. I wanted to tell you in person and took off. It was sad. Then we tried another recruitment strategy and another and another. In fact, several other recruitment strategies were used and it became clear that this was the most difficult area to resolve. Why were men not willing to come for this? Why was the buy-in so low? So I took it upon myself to find out what was holding so many guys back. I can talk to guys, I'll ask them, I'll figure it all out. When I spoke with men over and over again, the themes that held them back were fear and shame, disguised in a bunch of excuses, but nevertheless fear and shame, which are very important. Men fearing being judged by their peers or standing up about violence, in essence, being a victim of toxic masculinity while trying to prevent toxic masculinity. The dread of failure. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have the skills. I don't know a lot about this issue. I'll say the wrong thing. It scares me. I'm not a bad guy. I don't want to put myself out there for an allegation. But it didn't deter Slowly but surely, we chipped away, gaining volunteers with the support of all of these women. We wrote a business plan. We wrote a mission statement. We wrote vision, values. We created a structured plan of events. We developed a social media following. We spoke with local politicians, our local police service. We did public speaking events in universities gaining one volunteer at a time. It took a year to get six men. We did events. We did walk a mile in her shoes. We raised money for a local shelter. We participated in Take Back the Night. 
Politicians for Progress and a Valentine's Day campaign. Then something remarkable happened. The VPCC said, Luke, would you be willing to lead this group? Now normally when someone says, you know, we're thinking about you as a leader, um, you're, you're like, this is, this is wonderful, this is a promotion. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I have no problem being counted on or the extra challenges that come along with being a leader. That's not uh, an issue for me. But when this was talked about, this was different. I was scared. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have the skills. What if I say the wrong thing? It had all come full circle. However, I was very lucky because something else had been going on for me. I had spent years working with people who were victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. It's no secret that most of these people were women. I developed deep, meaningful relationships with these women and girls that gave me another perspective. It was a privilege and an honor to walk alongside each one of them as they began their journey of recovery. I began to understand the massive impact that gender-based violence had on their lives. I gained insight into the systems that often allowed the perpetrators of this violence to carry it out and the silencing effects that our culture has on speaking up about sexual violence and domestic violence. This was too personal. This was too important. I began to understand what was at stake. So what's my message for this conversation? It's simply put to say to each and every man listening, you belong in this conversation without analyzing or critiquing your breadth of knowledge on this subject. You belong here not because women need you. You belong here not to fight for women or to save them. You belong here because other men and young boys need you as a positive role model. A wonderful TED talk by Robert Eckstein asks men these questions. Do the women in your life that you care about regard you as an ally in the prevention of violence against women? Do you know what victim blaming is? Do you know what rape myths are? What type of language do you use when you talk about women? Do you automatically become defensive when you hear discussions about violence against women or male privilege? And lastly, do people look at you and say, this is someone I can share my story with without feeling judged and blamed. This is someone that I can share my story with that will listen and provide support. You may not be able to answer yes to each one of these questions, and it certainly should be a continued work of progress. If you want to continue this discussion, please email us at durhammentakeaction at gmail.com or drop us a line on Facebook to continue the conversation. A shift in culture starts with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luke. Uh, I think you can double the number of men if we look at all the wonderful men in our audience uh, that could come forward, so thank you. <clears throat> I would like to introduce our final speaker for this evening, Bonnie Porter, who's the coordinator for the Violence Prevention Coordinating Council of Durham. Bonnie Porter will deliver a passionate talk declaring love should, shouldn't hurt. While sharing ideas on how to turn the tide on violence against women, Bonnie says that there's been enough talk and now it's time for action. Each one of us, men and women, teens and 20-somethings, can influence and impact our workplaces, our homes, our communities. Anyone can become a leader for change. When it comes to assisting women of diverse cultures and backgrounds in overcoming barriers related to abuse and violence, Bonnie is tireless. She's a passionate mentor, advocate for the prevention of women, violence against women and encouraging women's empowerment. Bonnie was instrumental in successfully advocating for services to meet the needs of women fleeing abuse by establishing Horizon House, a shelter for women and children in Durham West. Over the past seven years, Bonnie has been challenging her efforts through the role of coordinator for the Violence Prevention Coordinating Council of Durham, DPCC, a community network of organizations, agencies, and individuals committed 
to the prevention of all forms of violence and abuse against women, children, and the elderly. She's a proponent of working together as a community to end violence and abuse against women and is committed to providing education and awareness that will spark change. Please welcome Bonnie. Thank you. Being the last speaker is kind of like being the speaker after lunch at a conference. <laughs> I'm just gonna move that to the side. I really appreciate the comments and the, the words that have been um, shared and the experiences that have been shared with us tonight so far. Um, it really spoke to me, the, the experiences, the um, information. It's, it's so important to um, be a part of this. And uh, Luke was being very, very modest in, in his efforts of, of what he's doing with Durham Men Takes Action. Um, recently, I was watching a TED Talk about a man named Tepiwa Chiwewe. And um, Tepiwa was, a, or is, a computer engineer. And one day, while he was driving to work, um, he looked over the skyline of Johannesburg, South Africa. And it's, he stopped and he thought, and he saw this thick layer of smog and pollution. Um, there we go. Um, he saw this heavy pollution and smog sitting over the city. And it hit him how much pollution was just bombarding their lives and in, over their city. And he decided that something must be done about it. But then right after that thought, he thought, yeah, somebody should do something about this. And then he realized and thought, oh wait, I'm a someone, but who am I to do anything about this issue? Because I'm only a citizen of Johannesburg. I know very little bit about environmental science, air quality management, or um, atmospheric chemistry. But he did care about quality of life for individuals and families in that city. He knew that as a computer engineer that there was no way for him to code a way out of the air pollution problem. So he had to become smart about how to solve it. He knew in order for him to be able to affect change, any change for this problem and to try and make a difference, he had to learn all that he could about pollution. So his first step was to do some research and study the data. He learned more about the magnitude and the scale of the problem and its effects on life and death of people in his country. He realized that in order to have any real impact, he was going to have to work collaboratively with others. So he decided to get to know people working in the field, officials from Johannesburg and the local scientific community. And through this process, he developed a deeper understanding of the problem of pollution in Johannesburg. His plan to improve the situation went something like this. He started off with his thought and his question, here's a problem, what can I do about it? Then he researched as much as he possibly could. He collaborated with the experts. He studied the problem to grasp its depth and significance. And then he determined how he could bring his skills together with the expertise of others in a meaningful way. After time and effort, they finally developed a solution to the problem, and I won't go into all of what that was because it was very technical and they lost me. Um, but they didn't come up with the only solution, they came up with a solution that was very helpful. They developed tools and systems to help individuals and families make better decisions about their daily movements and about where to settle their families. The real takeaway for, for him was that Sometimes when you're not an expert in a particular area, when you're an outsider and not a professional, you can see new ways to tackle a problem that those who work in that field or area may miss because they're in the thick of it. So you wonder why this slide is up in here and asking about, you know, what do I know about pollution? The whole point is you don't have to be an expert to make a difference. You can just start from where you are. I loved that Chipewe, no, Chipewe, I'm sorry, wherever he is, 
Um, I love that he saw a problem, that he, a citizen, an average person, took initiative. He wasn't an expert, yet he wasn't going to sit around waiting for someone else to fix it, to do something. He saw a problem, made a decision to do something about it. And he and his colleagues brought a fresh perspective to the problem. I like Tippi was, that's his name, experience to what's um, taking place, I liken his experience to what's taking place with regards to the Me Too movement and violence against women. It's as though we are overlooking a country, a town, a city, um, and we notice a problem and then we think that someone else is gonna take care of it. The Me Too movement has been powerful in giving women a voice to step forward, but it's not enough. It's time for tides of change, not just tides of change, but disruptive change. The phrase tides of change reflects the change that occurs when a rising ocean tide starts to recede or go out. We need a disruptive change, the kind of change that's not going to recede. We are not going anywhere but forward. We need people who are definitely going to take this somewhere with regards to the Me Too movement. The Violence Prevention Coordinating Council is comprised of 32 members, agencies, and organizations in Dur Durham region. They are committed to addressing the issues of violence against women in our communities. They are experts within the, the VAW sector. They meet monthly, we meet monthly, um, educating one another about the work being done to address the issues of violence against women. We also plan community events to build capacity, increase awareness, and be a catalyst for change regarding violence in Durham Region. I remember when I first went um, for my interview to become the coordinator for the VPCC, I didn't really want the job, but um, somebody had suggested to me, oh, you know what, you should, you should go to this interview. So I kind of, uh, at first I, uh, I applied and I didn't hear anything about, back from them. So then, I guess that was in January, in May, they were posting the position again. And uh, that's when someone said, you should go. And um, I did, I got called for an interview and went in and um, they interviewed me and I told myself, I'm really busy, I don't want this job. Um, and after the interview was over, I left and I thought to myself, if they offer me the job, I'm going to say no. So the next day, I had a call from Wendy Leader, who is, who is the um, executive director, co-executive director of Wise Wish and the YWCA in Oshawa. And she said, we'd love to offer you this job. And I went, that's wonderful. Inside my head, I was going, no, I don't have time for this. But anyhow, for the past three years, the VPCC has held conferences around the issues of violence against women. And um, Luke was speaking about one of them. We've, we've brought in the world-renowned expert and advocate, Jackson Katz. Um, the White Ribbon Campaign um, was the one that Luke was speaking about, and specialists on human trafficking. And these people who come to those day-long conferences were the experts. They're the professionals who work in the VAW sector in some way, shape, or form. The conferences are great, just like Luke said. People would be excited about what they learned, and then they'd leave with good intentions to make changes, but they're so overwhelmed by the sheer volume, and this is no criticism of them, but they're so overwhelmed by that sheer volume of the work that has to be done that they go back to their daily work and then back into their, their routines and responsibilities. The issues of violence um, against women continues to intensify, and the interest from the broader community to be the solution continues to stagnate. Uh, and, and change on the local level doesn't seem to happen. So last November, which is Women Abuse, Month, Abuse Awareness Month, the VPCC decided to take a different approach. We decided to create and develop a year-long community campaign and we called it hashtag love shouldn't hurt. Now this is similar to hashtag me too, um, but on a local level. Our hope for the campaign has been that we will get more involvement from individuals, the political sector, from business and from community at large throughout the Durham region. That we can reach people of all ages, stages, sectors, genders, cultures, to educate and bring awareness to the issues of VAW with the hopes that it will affect real change. Sometimes when people hear of a campaign like this, they are hesitant to get involved because they don't see how it impacts them and their world. 
they don't think they know enough about it or they think, what can I myself do about it? Just like to Peeway's initial thoughts. So they go on their way and they forget about the issues. Love Shouldn't Hurt is a campaign to raise awareness and action from more than the professionals, the experts and frontline workers who are involved every day. The issues of violence against women and girls affects all of us eventually. We believe that change can take place when everyone takes part. New slide. So, new slide. <laughs> so these are some of the stats that we um, have here in Durham Region. Um, violence against women and girls is an epidemic in Ontario, costing Canadians 7.4 billion. If you think that doesn't affect you, it affects you. 7.4 billion to deal with the aftermath of spells of violence alone. In Canada, a woman is murdered by her intimate partner every six days. Three of them were from our own town of Ajax in March. A mother and her two children, two teenage children, were murdered in March of this year in their own home. Next slide. Okay, what's the magic? Thank you. 41 women and girls and eight men and boys were killed in Ontario between January and June of this year because of gender-based violence. In Durham Region, the police respond to an average of 14 to 21 domestic calls a day. 25% of all calls for violent crime are domestic violence cases. And across the region for last year, the four shelters um, housed 608 women and 320 children. They turned away 1,080 women because they were over capacity. Shelter crisis lines fielded 5,507 calls and the numbers aren't any better for 2018. Um, Ontario is a hub for human trafficking. Police all over the province are grappling with the sheer numbers of women who are being um, trafficked for sex. Every hotel along the 401 corridor is being used for trafficking, and this includes the hotels in Pickering, Ajax, Whitby, and Oshawa. Okay. Yes. Girls as young as 11 are being trafficked and sold um, for sex. Most victims of human trafficking from 2010 to 2016 were under the age of 25, and I'll let you read the rest of the statistics yourself. But they're astonishing. Next slide. So what? So what about all of this? What can you do as an average, an average citizen like Tapiwa Chiwewe? What can be done to deal with violence against women and girls? The best way to prevent it, 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 the best way is to prevent it from happening in the first place, providing education and awareness about the issues that surround violence against women. If we want to make a difference, we can follow his pattern to improving a situation, research, collaboration, studying the problem, and how, deciding how you can bring your skills and your expertise um, together with others. And then that piece that Luke talked about taking action because nothing's going to change if that doesn't happen. So our Love Shouldn't Hurt campaign has been going on for this last year. Thank you. Even our Prime Minister got involved, sort of. He took the t-shirt. Um, if you go to the Love, uh, to the Violence Prevention Coordinating Council um, website, you'll be able to find dozens of resources on what you can do to help and take action with, with violence against women and the, Lo the Love Shouldn't Hurt campaign. And if you could just roll through just a few of the slides. You can complete this pledge. I have pledge cards with me if you'd like, or you can get them from, from us at the VPCC. Um, these are just some of the people who have taken the pledges. Um, during the kickoff in last November, there was so many people who'd, who'd taken the pledge and then posted their pledge card on Instagram, Twitter, and on Facebook. Um, so it's been pretty exciting. Keep rolling. And look, who's on this picture? <laughs> um, and these were another group of men that um, had taken the pledge. Keep rolling. And this was from Joanne's house or Joanne's place in Ajax, um, the shelter for young men and young women. 
and the um, even the Children's Aid Society, they got involved by using a rolling sign and posting the Love Shouldn't Hurt hashtag. Yeah. Durham Regent Police Office, head, head office. And so these are some of the things you can do. You can champion Love Shouldn't Hurt um, in your workplace, in your community, in your home. You can access the new resources. We put them out every, the first Monday of every month, and you can also go to the website and get what's there already. Um, and one more. So love shouldn't hurt. I want you to imagine a world with where there's no violence against women and children or girls. Go ahead, imagine it, because we do at the VPCC. Um, there was a woman, this is just how I'm gonna close. There was a woman who um, had started a shelter in Iowa, I believe. And when she was asked what made her so extraordinary, she said, I wasn't extraordinary. I just crossed the line to become something bigger. We all have it in us to become something bigger. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, I'm going to go back and I'll start with Bonnie. Um, which local resources would you point someone to if they're in need following an incident and what steps would they need uh, to take to, to become completely independent? Um, oh, I need this. Um, or I could use my mom voice. Um, it, it would really depend on what the incident was. And if a woman contacted myself or our agency or organization, um, we would find out what the problem was. We'd find out, we'd wanna make sure that she's not in any danger. Um, if she would want to call 911, if she was in danger or to have the police come to her home. Um, the, one of the problems is that when survivors or, or women have these experiences or go through these incidents, they don't know where to call. They haven't got a clue, and I've worked with many survivors who have said that, that finally they found a shelter or finally they found a counseling service. But most times, they don't, in most women in the community do not know where to call or who to contact. And that's the importance of everybody in the community learning more about this so that when they do have a neighbor or a friend or a relative who says, this has been my experience, that First of all, you just listen, and, and then you can say, well, you know, did you know that these things are available, and if you would like, as it had been said before, not pushing them into anything, but al allowing them to choose when and where and how that they are, are going to um, do that. And the second part of your question is, um, what steps would they need to take to become independent? That's a huge question, um, because for many women, it's it's so many different things, like, you know, um, whether they're financially stable, whether they um, need counseling, whether um, they need housing, that's the big, one of the biggest issues is that most women need housing. Um, so to become independent, it's, uh, again, it depends on the circumstances and the woman herself. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, this uh, question is for Luke. Uh, as a male, what would you say are your responsibilities in ensuring that this uh, movement and conversation continues and touches all aspects of social life? Yeah. Um, I, I think about it personally first, and uh, for me, uh, persistence and continuing the dialogue and expressing to my male friends this is an important issue. This is something that I am okay to talk about and I'm okay to learn and grow uh, as an individual and, and kind of be a conduit for that kind of thinking. Um, as well, uh, I think it's important to be an active bystander. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay to tell your friends and your family members their type of language or their comments or their jokes are, are not okay and, and here's why. Um, when I think collectively, uh, I really think that men have not truly embraced the ubiquitous nature of sexual harassment and sexual violence towards women. I don't think that's been done yet. And, and I would like to see that happen because the, the next step is what do we do about it? And so those are, those are kind of the things that uh, I would like to see and that I'm actively pushing for. Awesome, thank you so much.
Uh, this is for uh, Sidra. The, the movement was uh, initially centered on women of color, as you mentioned. It now appears to be more centered around Hollywood actresses and people of privilege. Uh, why is that case, um, and are we still listening um, to all the voices? Um, yeah, I think the, you know, the main reason is racism, you know, um, you know, particularly anti-black racism, you know, Tarana Burke has done so much amazing work and yeah, the fact that that kind of work isn't given the profile, it's because people don't value the lives of, of black girls as much as they do Hollywood celebrities. It's really unfortunate, but I think it's important to name that. Um, yeah, are we still listening to all of the voices? I feel like voices that are given are really, it's a, it's a double-edged sword because it's always good to see these conversations hitting mainstream media and it's good to see the conversations happening. So I, sometimes I feel like, okay, whoever they'll listen to, like, great, because at least we're talking about this, at least we're seeing a perpetrator being held accountable at least people are, you know, sharing their stories and getting this message out there. Um, but it, so it's a double-edged sword on the one hand, okay, if it takes Hollywood celebrities to get, break the conversation through, then so be it. But then at what cost, right? And does their victory trickle down to everybody else? You know, if a Hollywood actress is believed when she talks about sexual violence and she's able to afford to um, you know, risk being sued for defamation, that's a huge one. So many survivors don't speak out, you know, because a lot of how Me Too happened was through uh, stories in the, uh, in the news, right? So it wasn't even necessarily that the women went and pressed charges through the legal system, they just named names on social media and in the media. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you need to be able to afford the risk of being sued for defamation. Um, I, I have not named the perpetrator for that exact reason. I do not have the money to be sued for defamation. So do victories for people with that kind of money and that sort of privilege, you know, it's almost like setting an example that not everyone can follow. Um, so in terms of, you know, are we still listening to all the voices? I think we need to find more creative ways to give space, like Luke was mentioning, you know, create space for survivors to be able to share their stories in a way that they'll feel heard and they'll feel listened to mm -hmm. and in a way that's safe for them. You know, not asking them to do the same risk that a Hollywood actress could take, you know, but have other ways to be visible. Um, and, you know, kind of like the point I was trying to make in my talk, not even demand that people have to share their their story per se, but have other ways, like one, one um, tip I really like is rather than asking someone to speak as a survivor to to have them speak as an expert on sexual violence because mm -hmm. after navigating all those systems like absolutely survivors are experts so just yeah that's one thing I what you know avenue I can think of to help balance out the the louder voices and you know people who are who are marginalized um, yeah that's awesome thank you and I think you know a perfect example of um, giving women a voice, feeling a space where they're safe and heard and not uh, making them uh, re-victimize and, and reliving the trauma uh, in order for them to be believed and have that power and control. So thank you so much for your your um, discussion and your pr presentation. I'd like to thank our incredible panelists tonight. Uh, I would like to ask you to give them a, a round of applause for <laughs> spending their evening with us. We now want to open up our conversations uh, to our amazing audience that is here with us tonight, as well as uh, those of you who are sharing with us online. Uh, it looks like that we have a lot of questions from our audience, and uh, if we can hear from our first one. So if you, if you do have a question, if you want to come down to the mic, you can come and ask it here and we can just form a line. Um, or again, if you need, we can go around and collect post-its and we do have some post-it notes from prior to the session with some questions as well. So maybe I will start with one of those. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, so the first one is, how do we help more women and girls report? And feel free, any panelists, if you'd like to take this. Well, um, at Girls Inc., we provide curriculum programming and uh, a program for girls. We have um, Informed in Charge, which really leads the discussion all about power and control and consent. So sharing even scenarios and a lot of times um, sharing areas uh, to, for them to be able to, to practice those skills and tools in their toolbox sometimes then um, can, can lead uh, to, to showing and sharing what are some of those avenues, places to go for help and support, places to go to um, share and being heard. And I think that's how the Me Too movement spiked all that, was that, um, you know, somebody shared their story that rang true and all of a sudden it was, I see um, a sisterhood, an al a collection of, of allies uh, in a shared space where I feel safe, that I can um, feel that I can share and move forward. So I think it's important to have these spaces uh, for us to be able to share that. And I think it's also um, to be advocates and change agents where wherever we are. And so having specific curriculum that's designed uh, as young as six that goes all the way up uh, until 18 they practice those tools in order to look at when you say um, somebody should um, they practice on oh this is what I'm I'm doing whether I'm going to talk to my family my community my church my my group my gathering and so that's the that pebble in the um, in the lake that does that ripple effect Hello? Yeah, so um, I don't know. My perspective and from what I've seen and other survivors I've talked to, I think it's, I don't know if getting more people to report is a fair goal uh, because the justice system right now isn't really safe for a lot of uh, survivors. You know, if, um, if someone reports and then there are criminal charges and it goes to trial, like just really understanding what, like I think if you're uh, supporting someone in making the decision whether she wants to report or not, help it be an informed decision so that she knows what the risks and benefits are for both, for all the paths that she has to choose from, not to go in, you know, assuming that things are going to be one way and then finding out later, you know, having to be on a witness stand and cross-examined you know, these are all things that I think people should be aware of before uh, being told, oh, why, you know, just go report it. Like, help people have an informed decision about the risks and benefits of the different paths, so. Okay, I'll ask another one. Um, so the hashtag Me Too movement has existed for a couple of years. So how has it been affected after going viral in recent months? For example, mainstream media, misconceptions, diluting the intent of the movement, and so forth. So how has it affected the intent of the movement after going viral in the last recent months? So uh, misconceptions or diluting the intent of the movement. Uh, I'd like to say a couple things about that. I, I have listened to some of the criticisms of Me Too, and um, I, I would certainly say that I think the criticism, such as um, it creates a, a, a witch hunt against men, are, are ill-informed about the entirety of the intent of the, the issue, which is to bring to the forefront how, um, like I said before, how ubiquitous this issue really is. Um, this is not um, an issue that's just set up to shame men. And I think that's one of the main defenses that, that uh, some men bring to the table saying like, well, you know, it's just to, to uh, shame men and uh, it's to target these people and these uh, uh, women are coming forward at uh, times that then can destroy the man's career. And, and I think about that and I think, this woman has been living with this uh, memory 
each and every day. And I think about the, the Kavanaugh situation and, and I know that that woman is a, is a doctor and she's a, she's a professor and I think that she probably drew a line in the sand. I cannot stand silent for one more second while this man gets even more power without people knowing what he did. And so I, I think that was a very brave step. But just getting back to the question, you see a lot of people trying to criticize this issue um, and it just needs to be overstated what the actual intent of Me Too is. And it can evolve, and it should. So yeah, I just want to say some of those things. And highlighting that it's, it's, uh, it's not all men, it's not a men versus women, and there are so many amazing men who are champions and are allies uh, in the movement as well. And I think um, we have a, a great example right here on the stage. And I think it's really important also um, that when you see the backlash and the victimization or re-victimization a lot of times by things that are posted um, and you hear for example, in the Kavanaugh case where she had to had death threats and had to go to the FBI, that that can then also be um, a real strong signal to silence a lot of people. So I think that while it does do the forefront that we're having this discussion today and many people are engaged, um, it also does highlight the need to do more work. speak specifically to um, using social media and how people employ social media to engage themselves and on platforms such as Instagram or Twitter or sometimes even Facebook there's a certain element of anonymity that can be employed so people might feel a little bit more comfortable using a hashtag under an anonymous profile. So maybe they can build those relationships, build those conversations so that those, that discourse is happening, whereas they might not be comfortable having that face to face. So there is an online community. There are loads of online communities on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and these kinds of social media communities aren't fake. They're real, and they're real people. It's just that sometimes people don't share their personal names. So sometimes taking that first step can happen on social media, and then um, what happens after that is the decision of whomever is involved. Okay, we're gonna take one from the online. <laughs> Uh, we've received a couple of really good questions um, online. The first one comes from Twitter. How do we support survivors who don't want to be public, particularly if we're forced to interact with the alleged abuser? Um, <clears throat> it's hard to answer without knowing the specifics of how um, the person has to interact with the abuser, but um, I've spoken to a lot of different people in different versions of that situation. Um, yeah, I mean, in my case, I removed myself from spaces where uh, the person was present. Uh, but I think, you know, some of the things that I've heard that people do that work are have allies in the space as well so if you can find anyone who you trust who's also in the same space or who's nearby or you or you can check in with you know over your phone through texting just have some other people aware like okay I'm going to be at work from 2 to 6 today and we, I have a meeting and the person will be there right so just not being alone with it having a community of people like you because you were saying you know if the person doesn't want to be public have a network, even if it's people that you just know online, you know, find some safe people for yourself that you can check in with before and after the interactions happen. Um, you know, make sure to constantly remind yourself that it's not your fault. If it's an ongoing situation, I, I don't know, for some reason I'm assuming this is something in a workplace, to document everything um, where you can uh, in case eventually you do wanna come forward or build a case. Uh, and I guess just on a personal note, I don't know if this is like official advice that, that one would give, but uh, to put yourself first and to realize that your safety matters and, you know, kind of to go any lengths to allow yourself to be safe. So 
don't ever feel like you have to be in a place where your abuser is if you don't want to be. Like, give yourself permission to leave um, if it comes down to that. Yeah. Our next question comes from Facebook. How do you think that this recent Me Too conversation and activism, ac advocacy, et cetera, will affect policy and political change? It has raised a lot of questions in and around um, what we've seen uh, around understanding uh, consent, understanding um, uh, you know, health and sexuality and also healthy relationships. Um, so the um, Ontario government that is going to have opportunities for uh, people to talk about some of the curriculum and, and the repeal of the curriculum, but implementing new curriculum, I encourage uh, everybody uh, to utilize their voice and input in uh, looking at what uh, types of information that we want to be able to have for our youth and 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 our children it that's age appropriate as they move along so that you know we don't have to see documentaries um, like hunting ground or uh, mis representation where we are sending um, you know our, our students uh, out to post-secondary education without the skills and tools uh, for them to equip to navigate this and having those dialogues so um, that's one great opportunity for us to use our voice in in a form of action that's that it probably already has changed. And I think social and cultural and political change takes a really long time, a really long time. So when we change our everyday behavior, and I think all of us have talked about that to a certain extent that we are agents of change, whether it's in our own home and with our friends and with our family, these things happen first and then that creates the revolution. And you know, we, we see how long it takes for political change, for policy to change. It, it takes longer than it really could or should. And the, the biggest difference is how we as people behave on the daily, I think is, is where we really need to focus. When we start thinking about the big picture too much, we get overwhelmed and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, this is never gonna change. So if we, take it upon ourselves to engage ourselves um, with those around us that I think is the biggest, um, the biggest push. I'm just gonna repeat the question so that we do capture it. So uh, the audience member is looking for information on where more events of this nature are taking place or where they can find more information or follow um, to get more information. So the Violence Prevention Coordinating Council um, website has a calendar of different events that are taking place throughout the community from all different resources and all different organizations and agencies. is uh, Girls' Rights Week and uh, highlighting um, Girls' Inc. has a, a Bill of Rights and looking at uh, community action programs that are available and we have open forums the first week in, in May for the community for that involvement and it allows to demonstrate for young girls to, ha to see how they're change agents in their communities and connect them with things that are happening in their communities as well. So uh, having uh, community leaders and, and uh, advocates and champions as yourself in the community engaged in that as well. 
got one more question. How do we teach our children allyship at, at an early age? How do you teach an adult to be an ally? Well, uh, Girls Inc. actually has a program called Allies in Action, and it's being able to identify uh, uh, as young as uh, six years of age who your allies are. So you have your circle of influence, and you use just common language like um, the people in my inner circle that um, make me feel safe, respected, and heard. Um, and then you can have a outer circle that are maybe people that are in your close proximity that you come into contact with that don't, do not have that effect. Um, so looking at who you have in that inner circle and slowly building that so that when there are times uh, when you are overcoming and, and coming into difficulty that you can um, access your inner circle. So there are certain terms that we, we have seen with the increase of social media and um, the numbers of likes and sort of friends that you have. Um, the term that um, has been used is friend Enemy, so people who don't have your best interest in at heart, but you feel are in your inner circle, um, you can identify that they don't have that effect uh, on making you feel uh, safe, respected, heard, believed. Um, so you may want to move them out into your outer circle and then uh, build upon that. So there are many activities that we can do um, as a society. and have the conversation with your children to be able to say who do you identify as a positive influence in your life in your inner circle and help them expand on that as as they grow um my name is leslie um and as a survivor of domestic violence i first wanted to thank you all for the conversation that you had here today and on to my question. Um, I'm in the process of launching a podcast platform for individuals to speak about their trauma and healing journey. I found that me sharing my own story gave me power and I wanted to give that power to other women and individuals that have experienced trauma in general. And so I just wanted to know um, what are some more ways that I can facilitate and support survivors that do come and share their stories with me? And then also, what are some services in Durham that I can collaborate with when I do start holding safe space events in the community? Anybody can answer. <laughs> Pardon? Your podcast? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So for there's a really good guide called Use the Right Words by Femifesto. And in that guide, it has tips for interviewing survivors of sexual violence. It's kind of for um, people working in the media. So the idea behind those tips is to give, you know, gain that sense of control um, to the person you're interviewing. So you'll see the full guide, but among the tips are, you know, for example, providing all the interview questions well in advance so that they can prepare, there's no surprises, and, say, and they can say, you know what, I don't want to answer that. They can come with notes, you know, pre-typed, you know, this idea that you just have to put someone on the spot and surprise them with questions, like no need to do that at all. Um, ask them how they want to identify themselves. Maybe they don't want to identify as a survivor again. They might want to be an expert on a particular, you know, area that's related to their experience, but they can just share about that area as an expert without having to get into all the details of their story. You know, for example, you know, how are Indigenous women affected by, you know, housing when it comes to domestic violence. So there might have been someone who had that experience, but they can just share about the policies or the issues, the change they want to see happen rather than having to retell their story. So that can be an empowering way to frame it for people. Um, also um, encouraging to, them to bring a support person with them, you know, like have someone with you. You know, there's no need to, again, this idea, you know, come alone, surprise questions, like no need for any of that. Uh, yeah, they can have a support person. You can, um, you know, chat with them beforehand, afterwards, um, have, re you know, it's always kind of awkward to be like, here's a helpline if you need it. Like, but, you know, they, you know, have the support person, but also have resources for them as well. And um, I, I guess podcasts, forgive me, I'm not so savvy. They're recorded, right? It's not live. Oh, um, I have a website that goes along with it so that yeah. people that are actually listening 
if they feel triggered at any moment by the episode, they yeah. can go on the website and there are different exercises and activities or resources that they can That's look great. into and do stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. So if it's recorded, you can say, you know what? And you can listen to the recording before we launch it. If you say, you know what? I really regret saying that. Take it out. Yeah. Give them that control too. So, okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, if it is recorded, uh, you can go to them. So um, go to where they yeah. feel is a safe place for them to be able to. And uh, you may want to also look at uh, intergenerational and cross-cultural. So mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Um, you know, I've come across um, with amazing women in their late 80s who are yeah. um, disclosing certain situations that are happening that they've kept silent for for generations. Yeah. So. To say um, the podcast is the way to go. Uh, I think that's awesome. Uh, that makes me very proud. Uh, I certainly want to uh, post your podcast on all of our social media, and, and in fact, I want to be on your podcast. I so, was going to ask yeah, if anybody would that's like awesome. to. Awesome. Thank you so much. Resources. Again, if you go to vpccdurham.org. Um, all of 32 agencies are there with links to their websites. Perfect. Thank you so much. So um, another question, so how, so advice, so how do you deal with the issue when it resulted in a child and every day you see that child, so how do you deal with that? So yeah, so sexual violence, so how do you deal with the issue of sexual violence when it has resulted in a child and then you are seeing that child every day, um, so how do you deal with that circumstance? Experienced the violence? Is that what that is the question? The product, the product of, of sexual violence. Okay, yes. Thank you. A really complicated issue, right? It's multi-layered. It's not something that uh, I think would be appropriate to sort of try to gloss over. But um, uh, that person would would certainly. Um, benefit from some services that they think are, are going to be helpful, uh, as well as the child when uh, that time was appropriate. Um, and uh, yeah, that would be something that I, th that I would hope that uh, community members and it would take a village, you know, mm -hmm. for that. So, um, but yeah, that's uh, certainly something that I, that I know has happened in our community is, is uh, something that isn't uh, just something you'll see on, on some sort of exotic television show. That is real life. And so um, that wouldn't be the only person experiencing that. I could certainly understand why that would be um, a very um, isolating experience to go through. And I would encourage that person to seek support and take care of themselves. Thank you. We have one more from online, is that correct? Yes? Okay. And then we'll end it at that. Okay, great. The last question from Facebook is, what's being done to change the lack of housing for women in crisis? But we have, we, there is a, a national housing strategy now that's uh, been uh, released and one positive aspect of that is 25% of the uh, money is uh, allotted towards uh, women's housing. So that's promising, but uh, we'll need a lot of people to keep their eyes on that to see how it actually plays out and how the money is used in each province. But yeah, the National Housing Strategy, if you Google it, you could see the whole document and follow the different um, uh, individuals that are involved in that rollout in our province as well time you look at homelessness and, and, and housing is always an issue. There's never enough affordable housing and to be able to have the solution overnight it has to be a real, um, I think we've been having this conversation, I know I, for, for over 40 years. And um, so as we look at new strategies, new opportunities, it's 
it's not one level of government, uh, whether it's a federal, provincial, or municipal, it takes a community effort. And also looking at, um, you know, affordable housing strategies in our in our neighborhood as we have uh, new populations. And I have two adult children that boomeranged back, so <laughs> they're looking for housing too. Um, I would like to take this um, opportunity. Does anyone else have anything to say? For, yeah? To uh, our final remarks. I'd like to thank all of you that were able to attend tonight, whether you uh, attended in person or online. I'd like to give a big thank you to our brilliant speakers that are here with us this evening. And thank you to the Town of Ajax uh, staff, your volunteers, our community partners, and to you, our Ajax residents that had come here out tonight. Uh, you have created a night of engagement, of incredible conversation, and I invite you to take this opportunity to mingle, to network, and meet some of our presenters out in the front lobby. We have some booths and resources that are set up uh, that are outside from you, from Girls Inc., Horizon House, VPCC, OCASI, and Durham Regional Police Services as well. So I'd like to keep the conversation going. So please uh, save the date for our next In Conversation with uh, speaker seri series, which will be held on Friday, November the 23rd. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening and please drive safely. Thank you so much.